Good morning and welcome to the June 2018 Public Safety News Conference. My name is Leah Cordell and I'm the Logistics Officers Officer with Winston-Salem Forsyth County Emergency Management and I'm here to talk about our next, um, our upcoming CERT class. CERT stands for Community Emergency Response Team and um, what we're trying to do is during disasters um, can quickly overwhelm first responder emergency resources and leave communities cut off from support. CERTs are trained to take care of themselves and their neighborhood during disaster times. Our next class is going to be uh, next weekend, which would be June 22nd through 24th at the Royal Hall Fire Department. Uh, the address is 177 Royal Hall, Germantown Road in Royal Hall. The CERT class is a three-day class. It'll run uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and it consists of eight units. Um, you'll see disaster preparedness, fire safety, emergency medical operations one and two, light search and rescue operations, CERT operations or organization, disaster psychology, and terrorism and search. During the class, they'll receive, the students will receive classroom training from qualified trainers and or technical specialists uh, in the field. Uh, students will also get hands-on experience on what they've learned in class. Medical ops training, they will learn life-saving, um, how to treat life-saving threatening conditions, triage, public health considerations, establishing treatment areas, head-to-toe assessment, um, treating burns, wound care, fractures and sprains, uh, cold and heat related injuries. In the fire safety portion, they'll learn fire chemistry, fire and utility hazards, firefighting resources, suppression safety, and hazardous materials. Light search and rescue, they'll uh, learn how to um, rescue people from buildings. Uh, they'll learn, um, you know, they'll get to hands on how to use cribbing, lifts, carries and drags. Terrorism, they'll learn about um, the hazardous uh, materials. They'll learn about um, terrorist um, targets, uh, different signs to look for during terrorism. And then at the end of the class, we'll have a, um, a eight hour or a, the last day, actually, they'll get to run through a disaster drill while they get to practice all the, um, the techniques they've learned throughout the weekend. They'll take a final exam and then uh, they'll receive their certification. So if you have uh, people can go to uh, readyforsythe.org. Um, you can follow the link to register for the class. The class is limited to 30, uh, 25 people. And uh, for more information, you can contact our office. Our office number is 336-917-7070. Um, next, we'll turn it over to Deputy Chief Gary Stiers of the Forsyth County Emergency Services. And he's also the County Fire Marshal. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick uh, brief introduction. My name is Gary Stiers. I'm the Side County Fire Marshal. Um, and let me get my contact information up in case there are any further follow-up questions of some of the information we talk about today. Um, but basically my responsibilities are any areas outside of Winston-Salem or Kernersville and uh, do basically the same things once they have Kernersville Fire Departments and share some of the uh, responsibilities and some of the information we want to get out today is, is uh, of some importance to all of us, so we want to definitely talk about that. Uh, first things first, we want to talk about death and injuries this year. Uh, in the next uh, week or so, actually, the Fire Insurance Commissioner of the state of North Carolina will be in town and talking about some of our fire deaths and injuries throughout North Carolina. And I wanted to bring that to, to the attention. Uh, they're on the rise this year, and unfortunately, uh, Winston Fire Department experienced a loss just this week. Um, but they're on the rise since January 1, 2018, uh, till July or till June 1 is when I ran these numbers. We've had 90 citizens in North Carolina pass away as a result of a fire. Uh, this has nearly doubled uh, the same time period last year. 
Uh, so it is something that those of us in the fire safety committee or fire safety world are, are concerned about, and uh, we definitely want to get some education out there. Uh, so the big thing that's the most important factor are, are smoke alarms. We we'll definitely encourage folks to check their smoke alarms monthly. Uh, replace the batteries twice a year. In other words, uh, the, the easiest way to remember it is every time you change your clock, change your batteries and your smoke alarms. And then something a lot of folks don't remember, but you do need to replace your smoke alarm every 10 years. No matter if it's good, bad, or looks, looks wonderful, or you've not had any problems with it, it needs to be replaced at 10 years. And do follow your manufacturer's recommendations for the placement and locations. Uh, obviously, with the codes, uh, they are outside every sleeping area and in sleeping areas and on every floor of the home. Uh, but we encourage our citizens to look at the recommendations and install them as to uh, what is recommended by the manufacturer. Moving on to uh, something that's uh, going to occur more and more this time of the year is outdoor grilling. Uh, July is the peak month for uh, grill fires. We see 17% uh, include structural, outdoor, unclassified fires, followed by May which is our next biggest month, and then June. Uh, so we are in the middle of, of a time where we have gas grill fires. And what we find is folks uh, using them, obviously, everybody's using them more and more. And so we'd like to bring that to everyone's attention as to as some of the safety factors. 2012, 2016, an average of 16, over 1,600 patients per year went to the emergency rooms because of injuries involving grills. Um, half or 49% of them were thermal burns. Um, so and some of these can be attributed to the grills going out and folks lighting them, uh, excess grease buildup where uh, there is a fire and the fire grows and, and, and citizens can't put it out. Uh, so we see all kinds of a variety of issues with, with fires. The other thing we see are children that are injured. Um, obviously, we pets and children, you definitely want to keep away and keep a good uh, space around the grill when being used. Uh, on average, about 35% of the injuries uh, are, are children related. So definitely something to, to draw attention to as you're cooking, either grilling out or inside in your kitchen. Uh, you definitely want to keep that space clear of, of, of our furry friends and our children alike. Some grilling facts. Uh, grass grills were involved in an average of 7,900 uh, home fires last year, including 3,300 structure fires uh, and 4,700 outdoor fires annually. Uh, leaks and breaks were some of the most common causes, and what occurs is if there's grease buildup uh, and there is a fire, typically that grease will drop down on some of the rubber hoses used to connect uh, some of the propane gas, uh, gas cylinders, and we have a fire. 12% um, of the gas grill structures and 24 outside gas grill fires were caused by leaks and breaks. Uh, charcoal or other solid fuel grills were involved, about 1,300 fires including 600 or 700 structure fires annually. So you can see that uh, the problem indicates uh, the gas grill fires uh, are where we, we, we have our issues. Uh, that, that may go to show us too that there may be more of those out there, but there are different hazards with both, uh, both types of grilling. Some grilling safety tips. Propane and charcoal barbecue should be used only outdoors. Um, if you lose power or something of that nature, do not bring that grill inside. To cook. Uh, we have seen those occur for, for whatever reason. Uh, if you have a, a fire inside the home or if it's not properly vented, carbon monoxide does build up in your house and carbon monoxide is something that is very dangerous that we deal with. So always grill out outdoors and uh, that is the, the one main safety tip uh, first and foremost. The grill should be placed uh, away from any combustible materials. Uh, don't put it up, up against the home. Um, Try to keep it away from railing on your deck or anything wood or vinyl siding or anything of that nature. Uh, just keep it away from combustible items. Keep children and pets away at least three foot. Uh, keep your grill clean by removing grease and all the other things that uh, may drip down. So always maintenance it, keep it clean after each use and never ever leave your grill unattended. Uh, and that's just good cooking uh, sense, whether it be a gas grill or your home inside never leave cooking unattended. Cooking fires are, are our highest uh, potential or cause of fires that we, we see. Always make sure your gas grill lid is open before lighting it. Uh, if it goes out, uh, make sure to open the lid, let, let it vent out a little bit before you mash the lighter uh, again so that you don't have a, a gas buildup and then it ignite. 
Some other safety tips, uh, if you use starter fluid, only use charcoal starter fluid. Never use any type of other flammable liquid, uh, whether it be gasoline, kerosene, or anything of that nature. Charcoal lighter fluid is designed for that. Please follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Keep uh, the charcoal lighter fluid and any flammable liquids, for that matter, out of the reach of children. And when you're finished grilling, let everything cool down. And please, when you dispose of any ashes, whether it be with the fireplace or the grill, um, make sure they are cooled off. Uh, that they stay in a metal container for quite some time uh, before uh, disposing of them. Never put them in a bag and throw them in a the trash can. Uh, never throw them out in the woods. Um, they will cause a fire, so you need to dispose of them in a metal container until they, they cool off. And finally, fireworks. Uh, it is that time of the year where we do see fireworks uh, for sale. There will be fireworks shows and, and all the wonderful things that fireworks have to offer. But a uh, simple thing that we like for folks to remember is that if a firework leaves the ground, it is illegal in North Carolina. Uh, what we have is safe and sane fireworks uh, to kind of keep our folks a little safe. But it is recommended that you leave the fireworks to the professionals. Uh, go see a professional show, sit back, relax, let them do all the hard work, and you just enjoy it. But it is, uh, it is illegal in North Carolina if the firework leaves the ground. Uh, that, that you use those fireworks in North Carolina. It is illegal. It is also illegal for anyone under the age of 16 to purchase those uh, or any fireworks. So you will see fireworks available in, in local retail stores, uh, but they have to be purchased by someone at least 17 years of age. Uh, consumer fireworks include, you know, some of the things we deal with are sparklers, fireworks, um, and some of the things we want you to remember is why they're so dangerous is actually the tip of a firework or sparkler actually has a temperature of at least 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you want to put it in perspective, that's twice the, the temperature of a campfire. So it's hot enough to cause some significant burns and some significant injuries. So each 4th of July, our hospitals and emergency responders always see uh, an increase in injuries, a lot to children and teens, where they may be handling a sparkler, bump into someone, um, just there's all kinds of, of things that go on, uh, but we do see an uptick in folks being injured around this time of year using consumer fireworks. Nearly 90% of the emergency room fireworks injuries involve um, consumer uh, fireworks that are, are legal to use. So keep in mind that they burn at such a hot temperature that they are dangerous if, if something, uh, if you have a momentary lapse in judgment, uh, they are dangerous. They can injure you and, and cause some fires. To kind of give you some perspective, uh, Wood burns at about 575 degrees. We talked about sparklers being 1,200 degrees. Uh, so they instantaneously cause some, some significant injuries if you're not careful. So we always remind folks to be safe. Uh, go to the public uh, exhibitions or, or uh, the public shows put on by the experts. Um, try not to use consumer fireworks, but if you do use them, keep a close eye on children uh, and make sure you follow the recommendations, follow the safety um, uh, Precautions that we encourage you uh, keep keep uh, keep them in a place that won't cause a fire if they land on some dry brush. Uh, just take precaution when when you're using a firework. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. And I think Chief Jay Walsh is going to come talk to us about our first responders. Good morning again, and greetings from the Winston-Salem Fire Department. I'm Jay Walsh. I'm a division chief within the operations division. And currently this morning, we have three presenters for the fire department. Myself, I will be discussing first responder suicide awareness. We have Luli Beckless. We'll be talking about open water safety. And finally, Sabrina Stowe, our fire and life safety, safety educator, will be discussing uh, our smoke detector canvas and our 2018 Citizen Fire Academy. Suicide, that word by itself, is a difficult word to say. The conversations that surround suicide are even more difficult. Unfortunately, over the years, we have not done enough to have those difficult conversations. The Winston-Salem Fire Department, just like all fire departments and emergency responder agencies, including the police department, have taken steps and initiatives to try to get those difficult conversations out there 
to ensure that our first responders are taken care of when it comes to mental health. This slide up here I put highlights. You can do searches. You can look at social media. You can look at media out there. And it's, it's not hard to find news articles that talk about suicide and some of the things that happens to the emergency responders. Some of them, PTSD or you know, post-traumatic stress um, disorder is one that takes a lot of media attention. But unfortunately, there's so many other things that wrap into mental health that we need to look into that go a little bit beyond PTSD. I highlighted some of the ones up here that have got some national media atten attention. Chief Dangerfield down there at the bottom. You see that post on Facebook. He posted that just hours before he took his own life. Another one that got a lot of media attention uh, was Nicole up there. This was not PTSD, this was bullying. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, you know, bullying happens pretty much everywhere. But in the emergency services, it can happen just as much as you hear about it, say bullying in school and certain things. So we have to look out for our first responders holistically. And I put this stat at the bottom that was put out. It was a study done between 2003 to 2010. And as you know, studies it takes a little bit of time for those figures to kind of catch up. But they analyzed data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And in that time frame, they found that protective services, which includes police, fire, and EMS, uh, have a workplace suicide rate of 5.3 per 1 million workers, more than three times the overall workplace suicides. And unfortunately, as you'll see by the next slide, that number is a little misleading. Jeff Dill, which runs the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, tracks firefighter suicides. And as you'll see by some of these numbers up here, it's only what's reported. And you can look across the spectrum. This year alone, up to that point, which was about a month ago, there was already 26 reported firefighter suicides. Last year, 2017, 107. You can go back 141. You can kind of see those numbers as they relate. The issue with that is most statistics basically say that number is probably three times as high. Because as Jeff Deal puts, he cannot get everything out there to document every time something happens from a firefighter suicide. In 2017, they pulled some numbers. And if you can look at line of duty deaths, we talk a lot about line of duty deaths. Those we can track. There are certain things in place that we know almost empirically that those line of duty deaths will be reported. And if you look at 2017, and this also has firefighters and EMT and law enforcement, 93 firefighters and EMT that was reported from suicide, or 103 from suicide, pardon me, and 93 from line of duty. Line of duty deaths for police officers, 129 versus 140. And there again, those numbers for suicide, we're looking at being much higher than those numbers that you see. So that initiative has to be there to try to figure out how we can help our first responders to ensure that they do not get to that level. So some of the questions that we do when we look at those initiatives is why are first responders, police, fire, and EMS a little bit more prone? When you looked at that number, they're three times more likely than the average workplace. You have a thing such as acquired fearlessness. And basically what that means is just like police officers and fire we're trained to go towards the problem, not run away from it. So after a time, what happens is we build up that, as some people say, that S on your chest, that Superman mentality that you can pretty much get away with anything. Calls involving children, repeated calls, trauma and or death. You know, unfortunately, firefighters, just like police officers, we see a lot of that day to day, every day. Lack of sleep and fatigue, long hours. And then you have things like stress from work. You're taking it home. And unfortunately, in the fire service, we work 24-hour shifts. So a lot of that stress that you have at home, you bring back to work. And it's a constant cycle. Some of the issues that go around those stress factors is they talk about suicide as a dark secret. 
The issue is that suicide, unfortunately, we don't know everything about it because the person that knows the answers that completed suicide is no longer with us. We can't ask them what led you down that path. We can theorize, we can look at some of the things that was going on in their lives, such as PTSD and family issues, but getting that final detail of what led them to complete it is almost impossible. Well, it is impossible. The stigma that goes behind in the fire service culture, you know, we value tradition and history, and it talks about that stigma. We got to get rid of that stigma, that S on the chest, that we can get through anything and everything. Uh, a great friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, Captain Dina Ali from the Raleigh Fire Department, she has a little saying, she says, you know, it's okay not to be okay. We have to kind of preach that mentality so people can understand that they can reach out for help. So that initiative we talked about, or I talked about at the beginning, is some of the strategies to get away to help people know that it's okay not to be okay. Positive social support is, is, is key, you know, and that's one thing that you looked at, you know, if you read a lot of stuff that deals with suicide is that hopelessness, that's just that alone factor, is getting that positive social support. Getting rid of the stigma that suicide is, is a bad thing in the sense where those people who complete suicide are weak or, you know, there's problems in there. That's not the case at all. Departmental training, you know, the National Fire Protection Agency, they have certain things they've come out in the last few years. One of them uh, is part of their 1500 series is behavioral health and wellness programs. Uh, and learning about those things are tremendous for us in the emergency services to ensure we can offer those services. And some of those services that we talk about in that prevention is collaborating with mental health, is peer support teams, and the peer support teams offer very high value. In the Winston-Salem Fire Department, several years ago, we initiated a peer support team, which basically what that means is we have people that work day in, day out as firefighters who are trained, nationally recognized training, to become peer support, to be able to lend that ear to listen to their peers and be able to offer them support in that time and direct them towards mental health providers that could help them. The police department here in Winston, they have the same program. Nationally, you start to hear a lot about peer support. Uh, it's real. It's very helpful. We have a very robust program in Winston-Salem uh, that has done a lot for us in the short amount of time that we've been together. The big issue that we struggle with in our initiative is including retirees. These are people that have dedicated their life to carrying a badge to help others. They retire and get out. They lose that social Part, they lose that identification with their profession. So we are working towards developing better ideas for the retirees to bring them inside that fold. And one of the last things is allowing members to receive needed resources. And in, this, in that initiative, one of the things that talking to a lot of police officers over the last couple of years in peer support and fire specifically is that stigma that, well, if I tell somebody that I need help, they're going to take my gun. They're not going to let me do my job. Same thing with fire. You know, if I tell somebody I need help, they're going to pull me off the fire truck. So our initiative is to work with mental health professionals to ensure that we reach these people that need help early, talk to them, and understand that, you know, we can get them the help they need, assist them along beside them so they can continue doing their jobs and be effective in what they really love to do. I appreciate your time uh, talking about such a sensitive subject and just please understand that for those out there who are struggling, who may be looking at this news conference, all I can ask is that you reach out for help. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Luli Beckless. She will be your next presentation for Open Water Safety. Hello, I'm Luli Beckles, the Pediatric Injury Prevention Coordinator for Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. Um, we are the only level one pediatric trauma center in the region, so we treat um, injured children every day. And I'm here to talk about 
Open Water Safety, which was a research conducted by Safe Kids Worldwide in a campaign, and they fund what we do locally with Safe Kids Northwest Piedmont. So what is open water safety, or what is open water? Natural bodies of water, such as lakes, rivers, ocean, creeks, naturally occurring ponds, man-made bodies of water, such as irrigation channels, runoff channels, reservoirs, ponds, garden ponds, and quarries. Um, and why are we talking about open water safety? So overall drowning has gone down since 2000, but in 2016, we saw an increase nationwide. And at our level one pediatric trauma center, we saw 13 drownings between May and June 2016. So what we were seeing nationally concurred what we were seeing locally. Um, and a lot of these drownings in children happen in open water. Um, you know, uh, fatal drowning by setting, open water is 43% versus 38% in pools. Um, you know, we have seen a, a slightly decrease in the last 17 years since the year 2000, but not a significant decrease. And drowning continues to be a leading cause of death for children between the ages of, of 1 and 14. Setting by age, you can see the slide, you know, the, you know, as children age, the risk for drowning in open water increases. So as children get older, teenagers, they think they can swim better and they might engage in more risky behaviors. Um, open water by age and gender. Uh, males are four times more likely than females to fatally drown in open water. Another um, sad statistic, American Indian and Alaskan Native and Black and African American children are at greater risk of fatal open water drowning. And that's something that nationally um, we're quite concerned about. Um, water safety, um, the opportunities uh, for swim lessons need to be available um, to all children in our communities. Um, activities at the time of drowning, so playing in the swimming pools in the open bodies of water. Um, this is another statistics about location, lakes, river, and ponds. And why is open water drownings happening? Well, many of us um, sign up our children for swim lessons at the local swimming pools or um, the local YMCAs. And we may take our children to the river, the lake, the ocean, not realizing the difference. It's not the same swimming in a swimming pool where the water is clear in compared to swimming in a lake or a river or the ocean. And that's why it's happening. Um, so the visibility is different. The depth, distance, and accessibility, currents and tides, weather and seasonal differences water temperature, those are all factors that influence um, the risk of drowning in open water. These are some of the tips. Um, watch kids whenever they are in and around water. And we cannot emphasize this enough. It's so important that an adult be present at all times with no distractions, paying attention to the children. That's Sydney at Water Watcher. We're hoping um, to be at the community pools and around the lakes in our five county region, encouraging parents to designate an adult. Um, you know, if you're gonna go to the pool or you're gonna go to the river, the lake with a couple of friends, there should be a designated adult every 30 minutes you can swap, that somebody's not going to have distractions beyond the phone or chatting and is gonna be actively paying attention to the children. Make sure children learn how to swim and make sure that you emphasize to them the difference between swimming in open water versus the pool. Um, there are steps that they would learn if they take swimming lessons, um, how to float, how to turn around and orient to safety. And again, we cannot emphasize enough the difference between open water swimming and swimming in a swimming pool. Um, and the importance of wearing a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket when boating or participating in open water activities. We hope at Brenner's Children's Hospital to be able to provide, um, you know, 
personal flotating devices uh, this summer to children in the open water areas that we have in our communities. Um, so keep you know, non-swimmers in um, personal flotating devices that are approved. A lot of people use the inflatable um, winds thinking that those are safe and they will prevent drowning and that is not the case. Um, and the use designated swimming areas when at all possible. You know, um, drowning happens in a matter of seconds and is silent. It can happen within seconds and you don't even realize it. And it's so important that parents, grandparents, and um, members of the community learn um, basic water rescue and first aid CPR um, in order to respond in case of um, you know, a drowning. It's also very, very important if you go to a pool and open water safety that you know the address of the location where you're in. If you have to call 911, that you will be able to provide the address or the exact location where you are. And these are some of you know, the pictures or the images that Safe Kids Worldwide put together for this campaign that we were fortunate enough to receive funding to promote in our community so we can prevent drownings. Unfortunately, we have already seen a couple of drownings this summer in our communities. Um, and these are some of the differences. You can find uh, this on our Brenner Children's Hospital web page, the difference between open water and pools. And you know, our goal is to reduce the number of children that we treat and see at our level one pediatric trauma center. Um, because they drowned whether it was fatal or non-fatal. Um, we will be providing some of these resources for free, especially the water watcher cards that we will be distributing. And do you have any questions for me? Okay, now I am going to introduce the senior community educator for the Winston Salem Fire Department, Sabrina Stowe. Good morning. I'm just going to have a few notes and updates that I'm going to give you from the Winston-Salem Fire Department. We will be participating um, in the statewide smoke alarm canvassing day. This has been a day designated by the Office of the State Fire Marshal. Um, June 23rd, they're encouraging all fire departments across the state to go out into our neighborhoods, to canvass those neighborhoods, to knock on doors, to see who needs smoke alarms. Um, and we're going to be putting those up. We're not waiting until June 23rd. Our crews are already out doing this. Our goal is to not have any smoke alarms left in our inventory by June 23rd. But if we do still have some, we will be out canvassing on this day as well. Um, so we encourage people that need smoke alarms to go ahead and contact our office and we can make those available, installing those for our residents free of charge. They can contact us at our office, 336-373-7965. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we're going to be having our annual Citizens Fire Academy. We do this once a year um, for seven weeks. We invite um, community members to come out to see what the Winston-Salem Fire Department is all about. They learn about our operations. We teach them some things that they can do, um, fire prevention and safety in their own homes. Um, just touch a little bit on some of the things that are interesting for the public to know, um, how we do search and rescue, various things about firefighting. We let them come out and um, try out the uh, turnout gear, things like that. And we um, culminate that with a ride along at the end of the seven weeks so that they can get um, a better idea of what we do. This is free and open to the public. There's an application process. They can go onto our website to um, submit the application for that. Generally, you can just go to um, cityofwsfire.org and just go into our public education um, tab and get more information on how to become a part of our Citizens Fire Academy. Do you all have any questions? Next, we will have uh, police department presentations and we'll have uh, Police Chief Katrina Thompson. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Police Chief Katrina Thompson, and on behalf of the men and women of the Winston-Salem Police Department, I want to thank you all for being here again at the June Public Safety News Conference. First, please join me in honoring our fallen officer for the month of June who paid the ultimate sacrifice. 
Lieutenant Aaron G. Tice, end of watch, June 26, 1992. On June 26, 1992, Lieutenant Aaron G. Tice, a 24-year veteran with the Winston-Salem Police Department, was intentionally struck and killed by a suspect driving stolen construction equipment. The 15-year-old suspect directed the motor grader towards Lieutenant Tice's patrol vehicle, even as Lieutenant Tice attempted to move out of the way. As the grader collided with the patrol, off, patrol car, Lieutenant Tice attempted to exit the vehicle through the passenger door. However, his leg became stuck and he was unable to totally exit his vehicle. The suspect was thrown from the vehicle upon impact. The motor grader dragged the patrol car down the road, hit another police vehicle, and stopped after crossing a main road. By the time other officers were able to get to the vehicle, Lieutenant Tice had passed away. The suspect ran from the scene, but was later arrested a short time afterwards when he returned. He was convicted of second degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Please join me as we take a moment of silence to honor the memory of Lieutenant Aaron Tice, as well as the other men and women across our country who's paid the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Before I move forward with our upcoming events, I want to again thank the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department for their tireless efforts and dedication to the citizens of Winston-Salem, the Winston-Salem Police Department, and our city. Upcoming events, we are happy to announce that Operation Sweet Reads is on the roll. We will have our unveiling ceremony on June 21st, 2018, at 10 o'clock a.m. at the Benton Convention Center, lower level, in Piedmont Room 4. Again, June 21st, 2018, at the Benton Convention Center, lower level, Piedmont Room number 4. Please join us as we do our unveiling ceremony and introduce the Operation Sweet Reads vehicle. Also, our Youth Citizens Police Academy will start um, on Monday, July 9th until Friday, July 13th at the Beatty Training Center. We are asking that you please, um, if you know any youth that might be interested in law enforcement and what we do, we welcome them to apply to our process. Again, that event will take place on Monday, from Monday, July 9th until Friday, July 13th at the Beatty Training Center. Next up will be Sergeant Greg Dorn, who will talk about our unsolved homicide video. He will be followed by investigator Stephen Horsley, who will discuss the hashtag 9 p.m. routine, auto breakings, house safety, and vacation tips. He will then be followed by James Tomberlin, uh, who is a wildlife biologist, who's gonna provide us information regarding our bear. Just to introduce myself, I'm Sergeant Gregory Dorn with the Homicide Unit. Uh, in conjunction with the city's media and communications department, we have made an unsolved homicide video to be posted to the city's YouTube website. We'll just view that now and answer any questions afterwards. Shortly before two o'clock on the afternoon of March 27, 2017, gunfire erupted at 903 Rich Avenue. When police arrived, they found 19-year-old LaDawn Dion Morgan suffering from a serious gunshot wound to the abdomen. Morgan was rushed to the hospital, where she died from her injuries. 
A second person, 79-year-old Alexander Eugene Barber, was struck in the face by a stray bullet as he sat in his car down the block. At a news conference in June, homicide detective Michael Agnoski described what happened. This homicide was not a random act. This was a result of an ongoing dispute between two different groups of uh, individuals in our city. They decided to settle their dis uh, dispute with the use of firearms. One group was already at 903 Rich Avenue, the, on the front porch of the, the yard of that house. The second group arrived at 903 Rich Avenue in a, uh, several different vehicles. Gunshots were exchanged between at least one party from each group. LaDawn Morgan, it's important to note, was not involved in this dispute whatsoever. She was there visiting friends. She was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. We did not deserve what happened to her. Justice is what we seek. And we need your help for it. With St. Osaip County, we need your help. Justice for my sister, April Warren, her mom. Justice for the sleepless night she's having. Justice for the hard time she's having at, at work, life in general. Justice for her dead Fred. Justice and help for Fred for what he's going through, for what the family was going through. And most of all, we seek justice for LaDon Dion Morgan, my niece, beloved sister, cousin, and friend. Based on witness interviews, detectives are looking for a black male who at the time of the shooting had dreadlocks that went below his shoulders. Police believe he fled North Carolina after the shooting, but returned to Winston-Salem a couple of months later. We are still actively investigating this case and we need first-hand witnesses to come forward and talk to us. We know there's some witnesses out there that saw this happen and we need them to come forward. And that's what we need is a first-hand witness, not you heard through the grapevine or you heard Last year, we want someone who saw it directly that will come talk to us and give us a statement. That will help us get to an arrest. If you or anyone you know has knowledge of the events on Rich Avenue that led to the death of LaDawn Morgan, please call Crime Stoppers at 336-727-2800. You do not have to give your name. If your information leads to an arrest, you could be eligible for a reward of up to $5,000. Call Crime Stoppers at 336-727-2800. Two eight zero zero. It's part of the two groups. That should be included in your earlier press release. I think she was asking if the older gentleman was a part of the... Oh, no, ma'am. I'm sorry. I thought you meant... You said the first shot in the face, correct? Yeah. The first shot in the face was not part of... He was also an innocent bystander. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Investigator Stephen Horsley with the Winston Salem Police Department. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, some auto break-ins as well as some uh, summer safety tips because it is starting to get hot outside. Um, the first tip we want to give and remind everybody is as the temperature is rising, please do not leave your children and your animals and pets unmonitored inside your vehicle. Uh, we've all seen the videos. We've all heard the um, reports. We've seen the medical reports and everything of how hot it gets inside a car. Um, the next thing kind of going on what was already said why you're you take your kids to the pool the lake wherever you go don't be on your phone don't sit with a book don't get distracted it's easily distracted that's not just if you're watching children that's also watching your property your companions and everything like that while you're at at these places as you go out as you start to take your vacations for the summer uh, don't advertise that you're leaving and that you're gone wait till you get back to post on social media um, i know you let your friends and family know where you're going to be and uh, keep track that way. But don't post on social media, especially if you don't have a private social media and you're posting on public that you've left town. It's just an advertisement and invitation. Um, the other thing in regards to not advertising, have a friend or someone pick up your mail if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time or put a stop on it. Your postal worker will give you a form and they'll hold your mail till you return. This all leads into... Um, our 9 p.m. routine, uh, which is good for protecting your home as well as your, your vehicle. Um, as we've talked before, the 9 p.m. routine starts with simply removing your valuables from inside your vehicle. Um, 
or placing them in a place where they're not visible. Then you go out and you lock your car doors. You secure your vehicle. You return to your home. If you have a garage door, make sure your garage door is secured. Then you go and you secure all your windows and your doors, pull your blinds down. Um, and if it's applicable, set your alarm. And this right here will prevent you from being a victim of crimes of opportunity. What we're gonna show right now is surveillance video uh, that was taken from an incident where the routine was not utilized. Um, if you go ahead and play. As you can see, the garage door is standing open. And as we've shown before, uh, in many other videos, they, they go out and they'll start pulling on any car door that they can find. And in this particular incident, they get lucky and not only discover that the vehicle's unlocked, but the keys are in the vehicle. that was a matter of less than one minute up to the house found the unlocked vehicle took the vehicle and drove off that is what happens when the 9 p.m. routine is not uh, utilized utilizing the 9 p.m. routine would have stopped that the last thing I have is we're trying to attempt to identify the uh, two individuals in these uh, steals that were uh, breaking into vehicles uh, just south of downtown. If anybody knows who these are, please give Crime Stoppers a call at 336-727-2800. Does anybody have any questions? All right, if there are no questions, I'd like to call up uh, Mr. James Tomlin of the North Carolina Wildlife, um, who's going to talk about the bear. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chief Thompson and the police department uh, to come and speak with you today. As, as most people are aware, we've had a black bear in the Winston Clemens area that's caused quite a stir, so I appreciate the opportunity to come. Uh, my name is James Tomberlin. I'm a district wildlife biologist with the commission. I cover 11 counties in the northwestern part of the state, Forsyth being one of those. <clears throat> I'm going to just give a real brief introduction about the Wildlife Resources Commission. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of black bears in North Carolina, and then we're going to dive right into uh, you know, things that we need to be remembering when we have bears in town, uh, in residential areas, and then where the uh, local officials come into play and when the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, what role we play in those instances as well. So just briefly about the commission that was established by the General Assembly back in 1947 to um, conserve and protect our fish and wildlife resources here in the state through wise use uh, research and management. We have uh, five main divisions in the commission. I represent our wildlife management division. Officer Trevor Lemons is also in attendance, uh, represents our law enforcement division. Uh, we have a fisheries division, uh, habitat conservation, and, um, and our land and water access that handles our game lands management and boating access areas. We are the regulatory agency here in North Carolina to enforce uh, regulations for hunting, fishing, boating, trapping. And, and in, a, in a sense, our main objective is to keep wildlife populations in balance with the human populations in North Carolina. And as we're all aware, uh, North Carolina has been and continues to be one of the fastest growing states in, in the U.S. And so that, as you might imagine, uh, presents many challenges. Just briefly about bear history, um, and, and I'm speaking specifically to North Carolina, but this really applies to the range of the black bear across the southeast. Uh, by the early 1900s, black bears were almost extirpated or, or eliminated from North Carolina, and that was due primarily to uh, over-exploitation of our natural resources, logging, things like that, and, and also through unregulated hunting, uh, hunting it at any time of the year, uh, taking as many as you can, uh, no 
consideration for, for males or females and things like that. And then in particular here in the mountain region, uh, the chestnut blight that, that swept through the North Carolina in around the 1920s, chestnuts were a major and consistent food source for not only black bears, but, but a host of wildlife species in, in our mountain region. And so when the blight came through and removed that food source, it, it really play, uh, uh, played a, a major role in, in limiting bear numbers and uh, in addition to these other pressures that they were under. <clears throat> and so as a result of that, in, in about the 1930s, there was a, a really a, a big grassroots push for uh, for wildlife regulations, people started seeing numbers of critters going away, and uh, and so there was certainly concern for that. As I already mentioned, the, the Wildlife Resource Commission was uh, established by the General Assembly in '47 to uh, uh, to work on those issues. In the '60s, we started a, a massive effort on collecting black bear data to understand the distribution of bears in the state. Uh, their population growth, the numbers, things like that. And then in the 70s, there was a big effort to set aside uh, thousands of acres across the state that we termed black bear sanctuaries. And these were primarily on certain game lands throughout the state that uh, just provided a, uh, a protected area, if you will, for black bears to go about their daily routine and provide uh, additional bears for the surrounding area to, to repopulate those areas where there was suitable habitat, but there were not bears around. And I apologize for how busy this slide of the state is, but I've <clears throat> what it illustrates is uh, in the purple areas, if you can, if you can determine that, is, is the occupied range of black bears in the state in 1970. And so we can see that they were really relegated to remote mountain areas and deep deep swamps of, down on the coastal area of the state. And, and so what this slide really illustrates is the growth and expansion of the last 40 to 45 years of black bears across the state. And it really has been a, a true uh, conservation success story, not just here in North Carolina, but across their range in the southeast. And so uh, this map is up to date to 2010. And the, uh, the kind of orangish areas you see are, are our most uh, up-to-date area of where black bears are. And so they're certainly knocking on the door to our Piedmont counties across the state, whether here in the mountains or down on the coast. And, <clears throat> and that's going to come into play here pretty soon. But you can certainly see we have occupied bear range. And I should say that when I, when I say occupied, that means we have breeding bears in an area. So we have sows or female bears with cubs in those areas. And so in Stokes County and then over in Yadkin and Surrey County, we are our occupied bear range closest to Forsyth. Let's talk a little bit about black bear biology. It's certainly important to know uh, about the critter if, if we're dealing with an issue uh, or if, if, they were, if they are in an area. And, and, and I'm going to speak specifically to the spring and summertime period because you know, quite consistently over the last several years, we've had bears in Forsyth County, whether it's Clemens, Kernersville, Winston-Salem. This is not an uncommon occurrence, and it's, it's going to continue to be that way. <clears throat> and we do have increased movement and activity of bears this time of year, in the springtime and throughout the summer. And that's for a variety of reasons, and in particular, as the, is the case with our, our current bear situation, we have dispersal movements of young male bears in that yearling time frame, which is about when they're between one year old and two years old, these young males and sometimes the females will venture out of where they were born. And that's uh, just mother nature's way of, of range expansion, making sure the family tree forks. And so these bears take off and, and move into areas to try and find their own home range. <clears throat> and usually the cause for that is the as mama uh, mama bears doing that, but along the way, those male bears that are also around will keep them moving. And so they can cover quite a good bit of territory. It's not uncommon for those dispersal movements to go 60 miles or more. So, uh, And they tend to go along major river drainages, for instance, the Adkin River, the Dan River, those type areas. Mating season for bears occurs during the summer months of June and July, and so uh, as you might imagine, during the breeding season, those males are making bigger movements, trying to find receptive females to breed with. <clears throat> and then at, at the same time, natural foods can be limiting that time of year. A big part of the bear's diet 
uh, during the summer is soft mass, so blackberries, blueberries, uh, those types of fruits, and those usually don't come online until later in the summer. So there's a transition period that we're going through right now where natural foods can be limiting. As a result of that, that can lead to increased movement by bears in search of food. So what do we need to think about when we have this situation of bears being in town? And, and really the first thing is that we don't need to panic about it. Bears are not aggressive toward people, uh, and, and in particular these dispersal movement situations with, with young male bears. <clears throat> they're just, have really they've just realized they've taken a wrong turn and they've ended up in town. They, they don't necessarily want to be here, uh, but they're just on the move and on the search for food. They go where their nose takes them, and uh, and so Oftentimes, they'll find themselves in town. Uh, certainly notify your local enforcement officials. Uh, and then really crowd, crowd control becomes uh, very important in these type of situations. We want these bears to continue moving through an area uh, without any impediments to that. Certainly, if they feel threatened, they're going to climb up a tree and they're going to stay there. And people in the area taking pictures, uh, you know, People haven't seen a bear before. It can be a very interesting situation. It can be unnerving uh, to some folks. We understand that. But uh, they're certainly safe to view from a distance, but we don't want to crowd them and make them feel threatened because that's going to just result in them lingering in an area. We want, we want them to continue moving. Certainly reach out to the Wildlife Resources Commission. I have a, a phone number listed there for our wildlife helpline. Uh, your county enforcement officer or myself, the district biologist in, in your area. It's important that we do not approach bears at any time. Uh, bears, as I mentioned, are not generally aggressive, but they will defend themselves. And they do feel threatened when people come close to them. Please do not approach bears. Do not try to feed them. Don't shoot at them. Uh, don't chase them. Out of, try to chase them out of an area. Don't corner them. <clears throat> or attempt to immobilize them in any way. And as I mentioned, with these dispersal movements, they will typically move throughout the area uh, in a short amount of time. Bears in suburban and rural areas, you know, once you get outside of the town limits and city limits, uh, we, get, uh, we can get fairly rural pretty quick. And so <clears throat> really the name of the game there is making sure that we don't have anything attracting bears to come around the house. Uh, and that's primarily through unsecured garbage or trash, bird feeders. Uh, bird feeders pack a high amount of calories, and for a bear, that's a, that's a really good quick meal ticket in a short amount of time. Uh, so bird feeders, if, if you have bears active in your area, take those bird feeders up for several weeks until that's, that bear's moved through. Um, making sure your garbage is secure. Pets. It's important that we don't feed pets outdoors and certainly don't leave pet food outside over the night. If you, pe if you feed your pets outside, feed them, take those food bowls inside, don't make that food accessible overnight. Cleaning grills uh, is another good thing. Don't pour grease outside. Uh, just good, you know, tips around the house to, uh, you know, general cleanliness and maintenance can go a long way when it comes to black bears and just wildlife in general. Notify your neighbors, uh, notify the Wildlife Resources Commission. Again, leave the bear alone. Do not approach it. And then again, crowd control is important. Uh, we don't want that bear to feel threatened and, and go up a tree where they can stay for an extended period of time. We want them to move through the area. Managing human-bear interactions. And, and we often, when we find bears in places where they uh, don't typically range, you know, our, the first call that we usually get is to come catch it and, and relocate it to somewhere. And, and that's not a standard policy by the Wildlife Resources Commission for a variety of reasons. And I've got those listed here. Uh, bears have a, a, a pretty good honing instinct. We, we, it's well documented when you, when you capture bear and take it off somewhere, it, it's going to tend to find its way back to where it came from. <clears throat> so that really doesn't resolve the situation. There's high mortality rates associated with relocating bears as that honing instinct kicks in and they're moving back to the area where they came from. They tend to end up dead on the highway from a vehicle collision. <clears throat> There's really no unoccupied areas left in North Carolina for us to take bears. Um, and, and like I said, it doesn't really resolve the issue 
more importantly, it's is what can we do uh, around the house and in our neighborhoods to make sure there's no attractants there to keep the bear around. <clears throat> and and certainly that process of trapping and relocating a, a bear it can be difficult and dangerous for, for everyone involved, including the bear. So when bear conflicts require action, and there are certainly some instances where, uh, you know, we're called into action when a, uh, when a bear's in the area. <clears throat> Number one is when the bear's injured, and, and primarily that's through a vehicle collision. Um, and as I go through this list, I, it's important for me to say that, that we um, assess these situations on a case-by-case -case basis, and we do that in consultation with our chain of command and, and certainly local officials. Um, a bear that's injured can be a dangerous animal. They can feel threatened, uh, more apt to, to uh, be defensive and, and aggressive. Uh, but uh, not all collisions are the same, and if the bear is, is determined to be okay, uh, no broken limbs, able to move through the area, uh, it's likely that we're going to allow that bear to keep moving through. If it's determined that the health of the bear is in jeopardy, uh, then we'll take steps to remove that animal and, and uh, take care of it. If the bear contacts a person unprovoked, um, this is a very rare situa situation. Uh, and again, the importance of why I, I stress that we do not approach bears, uh, that is, is more common when a bear contacts a person. It's, it's often as a result of the person approaching a bear, trying to feed it, trying to get a picture with it, that type of situation. But if a bear contacts a person unprovoked, then that's all bets are off and, and that bear will be handled immediately. If a bear breaks into an occupied dwelling or house, a uh, tent at a campground or a, or a parked car, if those uh, areas are occupied, then that bear has crossed the line. Uh, it's probably conditioned with food and past experience. And that's why it's important that we don't feed bears because when we, and, and wildlife in general, when we do that, they lose their natural fear of humans. And that's when uh, they can become um, more aggressive in their approach to us because they associate us with a free meal. And so that's why it's important that we don't feed these animals. The bear's cornered in a mun municipal area with no clear avenue for escape. And, and as was the situation with uh, this, this recent bear movement through Winston-Salem, Haynes Mill Boulevard, the Clemens area, uh, we had, you know, instituting good crowd control. There's areas for that bear, <coughs> creek drainages, wooded areas for that bear to move through. Uh, we just had to give it space and time to do that. If it is cornered in a municipal area and there's really no clear avenue for escape, then we'll assist in that situation to, <clears throat> to get the bear out of there. If a bear demonstrates no fear of people and aggressive behavior toward people, um, again, I understand it can be a little unnerving for people to see a bear in an area that they haven't ever seen one before. Bears are not generally aggressive. Uh, some aggressive types of actions that bears uh, might make would be approaching people or following people. Those would be behaviors that we would consider aggressive. Uh, a bear standing on its hind legs is not an aggressive behavior. That's essentially that animal trying to get its nose as high up in the air as it can so it can smell you, smell its surroundings, view its surroundings. Um, bears that are huffing or groaning or, or clapping their their jaws is not an aggressive behavior. Those are defensive uh, behaviors that the bear is making. It's saying that it feels threatened and you need to back away. Uh, but aggressive behaviors that, that are red flags for us would be when we get reports or see bears that are approaching people and following people. And again, that's, that's often the result of a bear being conditioned by food, uh, being fed by people. So these are instances where the Wildlife Resources Commission would <laughs> Uh, take a variety of actions uh, to resolve a bear situation. That could, uh, that could be capture and removal of the bear. It could be through hazing or, or aversive conditioning of the bear. Uh, it, again, it's a case-by-case -case situation, and, and we handle that with our chain of command and, and consultation with local officials. So that's all I've had there. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. If not, I'll hand it back to Chief Thompson. 
Thank you. Thank you for that information. Are there any other questions for the police department? If not, then this will conclude the June 2018 Public Safety News Conference. Thank you all for being here.